Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, welcome to the Vestibular Disorders Association webinar on managing your health information. VITA is a national and actually international association that advocates for people with vestibular disorders. And I am Rose Dunn, a member of VITA's 2019 Board of Directors and also a vestibular patient myself. In this webcast, we will discuss why you should collect and organize your health information, how to collect your health information, what types of health information you should collect, how to obtain your health information, your rights under HIPAA, how to designate a personal representative, utilizing health information technology and e-care type of services, and the value of tracking expenses. So let's dive in and talk about why you should collect and organize your health information. <clears throat> your journey in treating your vestibular condition will include meeting with multiple providers, having tests at various facilities, and receiving treatments and medications. Tracking who said what, when, and where treatment was tried and whether it successfully addressed your conditions will require record keeping and tracking your progress. The results of treatments and how providers addressed your needs will help you make informed conditions about the next step in your journey. Additionally, your logs and records will help others help you. This example from Understanding Healthcare is one reason why you and your family should maintain records of your journey. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and read this. After my mother died, my mentally handicapped sister came to live with us, said Jim, a 45-year-old father of three. Jenny had multiple health conditions and her care was overwhelming at first. Jim's mother had died suddenly, leaving little information about the care Jenny needed. We sorted through mom's things, looking for medical records that would give us a clue about what to do. We even looked on her computer. After finding doctors' names on prescription bottles, Jim began piecing together his sister's medical history. It taught me a lesson, he said. I realized that we didn't even have our kids' immunization records. If something were to happen to me and my wife, someone else would be just as confused. <clears throat> I realized we had to get organized. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Our journey as vestibular patients will include seeing many providers, many of whom will not know each other, and more likely will not have access to the medical records each of those providers created. We must serve as the glue that keeps each provider informed of our test and treatment results. When patients see multiple providers in different settings, none of whom have access to complete information, it becomes easier for things to go wrong. And we don't want things to go wrong. So our goal must be to be an instrumental member of our care team and map our progress and the progression of our conditions. This brings us to our next topic, how to collect your health information. And it will be a bit tedious to do so, but we're gonna talk through some of the challenges and some of the items that are gonna be important for you to collect. A common approach to collecting our health information is to compile a personal health record. A PHR is defined by the American Health Information Management Association and the American Medical Informatics Association as an electronic, universally available, lifelong resource of health information needed by individuals to make health decisions. 
individuals own and manage the information in the PHR, which comes from healthcare providers and the individual. The PHR is maintained in a secure and private environment with the individual determining rights of access. The PHR is separate from and does not replace the legal record of any provider. So let's move on to creating our personal health record. Although it's preferred, your PHR doesn't need to be electronic. It doesn't have to be fancy. It can be a simple spreadsheet, which you can use to record ongoing care facts, such as your provider's names, specialties, dates of care, tests and treatments, and so forth. It can be stored on a CD, a DVD, a flash drive. It can be stored on paper. But you want something, preferably, that is portable and easy for you, your caregivers, and your providers to access. There are four good reasons for keeping a PHR. The first is the ability to provide your doctors with useful information in a timely fashion. The second, the ability to look back and recall what care was received. You know, oftentimes when we've had some care, we remember it very clearly for the first few weeks, but then it drifts away. The third, the ability to have access to the record in case of an emergency. And in this situation, we want to make sure that someone else in our caregiving team, it may be a spouse, a sister, a relative of some sort, also knows where we keep our PHR. Because if we are the patient and it's our emergency, we may not be able to access it. And then number four, to ensure the proper use of prescription drugs. This last one is particularly important for your providers. When we see multiple providers in unrelated physician practices, they need to know which drugs we are taking for what condition to avoid prescribing a medication that may cause an unintended drug interaction. <clears throat> Next. What information should we collect? Well, earlier we mentioned some items to collect on an ongoing basis in our simple spreadsheet, <clears throat> but your PHR needs more information, including some basic foundational information, including your identifying information, such as your demographics, like your name, your date of birth, your address. And when you put your name in there, include your middle initial. And if you've had another name that you may have been treated under, include that as well. And it should include your health insurer ID numbers. Often we may have more than one insurer, so we want to include both numbers. Your family history. You know, capturing data about other family members will help your provider because there may be conditions that are hereditary. So capture those conditions that some of your family members may have had that you may also have. Noting other family conditions is important because symptoms that you're experiencing may be indicative of, of other hereditary conditions. Also capture a brief social history. Are you married? Are you single? Do you live with someone? <clears throat> is there someone there that could perhaps take care of you if you become um, debilitated? Are there stairs in your home? And do you use alcohol, tobacco, or other substances? All of those are important to your providers in knowing how to develop a care plan for you. Other data that you should record include your current medications, both prescribed <clears throat> and over-the-counter medications and supplements. A bit of history about the immunizations you may have had, and perhaps immunizations that you may have had because you travel to other countries. Your advanced directives, or those um, uh, plans that you wish for others to follow, 
should you have an untoward event in your care, should be in your personal health record. It's important that your physician knows about your end of life wishes. Include your healthcare proxy's name, that is that person who you wish to have the right to make decisions for you if you are hospitalized or unable to make decisions. Be sure to include that person's contact information. Additionally, you'll want to include allergies and any reactions associated with those allergies. In your record, you will also want to include medical and surgical history. Medical conditions, you want to include when they were and what treatments were prescribed for those conditions and any conditions that have since been resolved. Surgeries, for what condition and when, and then any accidents or falls or related injuries and when those occurred. Now that we have the foundational content compiled, we need to capture our ongoing care data. And our ongoing care data should include who is currently or has cared for us, when we saw them, and what did they do for us? Earlier, we introduced the subject of PHRs, and we talked briefly about the simplest of PHRs, the spreadsheet. So let's, let's explore now the different types of PHRs that we could consider using to capture this information and maintain it for the entire journey of our care. The standalone model may be paper-based or electronic. The paper style is easy to compile. They may include printed materials from your providers or your provider's portal. Often the documentation is stored in a file folder or a three ring binder. And if you have a lot of treatments, you may just have one very huge envelope that you keep it all in. This style is typically not carried with you because it doesn't fit neatly in a purse or even in your back pocket. The paper PHR's drawbacks, of course, include lack of accessibility in emergency situations, unless someone happens to know where your folder is kept and lack of quick search functionality, similar to the search capabilities we have on our computer, when you have a file folder of paper, it's just not easy to search. Now, there are electronic standalone PHR models, and they too come in two types, a simple one or um, through a third-party application. Regardless of the digital type, it can be available to you on your PC or your smartphone in your documents folder. The simple version, like I said, can simply be a spreadsheet or a Word document. You might even wish to save it to a flash drive that you carry in your purse or you carry in your pocket. It should be password protected. If you lose that flash drive, you do not want someone knowing all that personal information about you. But if it's password protected, one of your caregivers need to, needs to know that password. Because it's electronic, it can be available anywhere, anytime via an internet connection. And it's of course easy to carry it with you. One advantage to creating your own electronic PHR is that it is free. You, however, assume the responsibility for making sure that your PHR is kept current. The other type of electronic standalone PHR model is one that is available through a third party, such as an app that you may download for your PC or your smartphone. These apps provide structure for the content and prompt you to enter certain information. 
If it's on your smartphone, it can be available anywhere, anytime, again, via the internet. These apps range from free to fee, so there may be a charge for them depending on the app that you choose. You assume, again, the responsibility for making sure the PHR is kept current. Regardless of the format, if you keep your health content on your smartphone, once again, you should password protect your phone. And then someone needs to know your password so that if it's an emergency, your provider can access that health information about you. On this slide are some options for you to review various PHR apps that are available out there. Um, and I've shared with you some that you can find for your smartphone uh, and how to go about accessing those sites to be able to see the various options. There are also options for you to use on your PC. The electronic standalone models often result in um, an application that you will download um, to your PC or your cell phone. These applications often support copying content to external devices, such as CDs or flash drives. You'll want to make sure that that feature is available to you so that you can provide copies, if necessary, to your providers. They're easy to carry, as I mentioned earlier, and they may also permit uploading your information to another platform. The digital format is convenient for you and certainly convenient for your providers. There are two cautionary notes, however. Purchased apps, can come and go. For example, you may have an app that no longer is supported by the vendor. And in that case, you may lose your information if, for example, it's a web-based app and it's retired from the web that supports it. Maintaining your own PHR takes time. And so if you keep it in a system that you control, you know it's there. The second caution is that providers are sometimes leery to allow uploading information from your external devices, such as a flash drive or a DVD or a CD, because of their concern that those media may contain viruses or malware. So you definitely want an application that will allow you to print it out into paper or to a PDF that the provider can then store in their electronic health record. Additionally, you may want to think about an application that could work on a notepad or a notebook that you carry with you because then you can view it together with your provider when you're visiting with the provider, and then send a PDF copy of the information later to him or her, or while you're waiting there with him. Now, moving from the standalone models, let's now discuss an integrated model. <clears throat> integrated models include your clinical information obtained from patient portals, and health information exchanges, which are composed of a network of electronic health records, or EHRs, that are used by your providers. This results in the integration of your information from multiple providers and available online. These models provide ease of access to information by your providers but only if all your providers are on the same system or participating in the same health information exchange. The portals provide ease of access for you, but they may not contain your entire record. Oftentimes, the documents that are stored on the portals 
are what are known as key documents, such as dictated reports or transcribed reports, like a history or a consultation, and lab results or an x-ray result. Now, it's easy for you to access your portal, but once again, only if you stay within the same health system. When you have some providers in one health system and others in another that do not contribute to the same health information exchange or the same or utilize the same electronic health record, then the information is not always integrated and it may require you to access multiple portals. And those multiple portals could result even within the same health system if the physician offices within the system are on one electronic health record, but the hospital is on another. So unfortunately, getting your information from these electronic health records and patient portals can sometimes be cumbersome. Now, some of the integrated models may contain information not only provided by the various healthcare entities and providers that you're seeing, but also from health insurers and employers. That's a definitely a mixed integrated model that has much more information about you. <clears throat> this mixed integrated model offers you access to, again, parts of your electronic health record, but also claims data, again, via those patient portals. There's three concerns that I want to share with you with these models. Your documentation, again, may be on different portals. If you change health systems or relocate, <clears throat> you may or may not be able to access those portals after a certain period of time. And you usually are not able to add your own information that you've um, accumulated to these portals. But the benefit there <clears throat> is because the information is available through the web, you can access it anywhere and any time. <clears throat> because your data may be on multiple portals, you need to remember your password for each of those portals. So consider using a common approach, like using your birthday at whatever the name of the facility is. So in this example, I said your birthday at St. Elsewhere, so May 5th at St. Elsewhere. But if you're being treated at Mercy or um, Downtown Community, you, it would just be your birthday at downtown community or your birthday at Mercy. Using a common approach for your portals will help you remember those passwords. Okay, <clears throat> that's enough about PHRs. Let's talk about how you can obtain your health information. There are several options. First, ask your provider for copies of your record before you leave the office. That's usually going to include the notes from that day and perhaps any test results from the previous visits you had. If you are in a hospital setting, ask for a summary at the time of discharge. Of course, access your patient portals whenever possible and download the information, if possible, from those portals for your PHR. Now you can also request copies from the Health Information Management or Medical Records Department, but recognize that your request may take a few weeks to fulfill. Finally, you can request to access your records and take your own notes. Now when you make that request, carefully use the term access, as this term has a specific meaning under the HIPAA regulations. Now, when requesting copies of your record, you may have to use the facility 
or the provider's form. Often these forms are on their website. When you write your request, include the following information. Your complete name, date of birth, your address, your telephone number, the dates when you were seen at the facility or the office, and what you wish to receive specifically. Avoid asking for all records and specify which dates of care you're most interested in. If you can specify certain documents, that's going to make the request move along a lot faster. The documents I would suggest that you may wish to ask for, which have the most content in them, are your history and physical exam, progress notes, and you may want to identify which physician you're most interested in having the progress notes from, a discharge summary, consultations, lab test results, radiology results, and pathology results if you had a um, specimen removed. Always indicate whether you want paper copies or electronic copies. Some organizations may not be able to provide you electronic copies on a media like a flash drive or a CD, but they may be able to send them to you in an email as an email attachment in a PDF form. If you do get them via email, the email be, may be encrypted, so you will have to log into a site establish a password, answer perhaps some security questions, and then you'll be able to download that email. Indicate where the copies are to be sent. This is important if you're having them sent via mail. And then sign the request and date it. So since this is all related to requests for copies of records, we're going to talk about HIPAA, because it's HIPAA that enforces and has the rules regarding uh, receiving copies and having access to your records. <clears throat> so, your rights under HIPAA. Well, first, what is HIPAA? Well, its official name is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It was primarily created to simplify and make billing processes uniform among providers and payers. Somewhere along the way, the privacy protections for patients and their protected health information, PHI, were attached to that law. And along with the privacy protections, it includes certain rights for patients. Now, before we discuss your rights, what's protected health information? Well, PHI is defined as, as health information that is maintained or transmitted in any form, including oral communications <clears throat> that was created or received by a healthcare provider, relates to the past, present, or future physical or mental condition of an individual, provision of healthcare to an individual, or payment for that healthcare. It identifies or could be used to identify an individual. So when you take your PHR, either on your flash drive or in a paper folder, to your provider and share copies with that provider, they have received PHI because that information identifies you. When they create their medical records and their electronic health record, they are creating PHI, again, because it identifies you. And it was used for your health care in the present or in the past, and possibly for the payment of your health care going forward. Okay, so let's move on to our first right under HIPAA. We're going to discuss the right to obtain copies. When you request copies, there may be a charge. You can only be charged for the time and cost of copying your records. So if you see on a statement that you're being charged for retrieval fees, 
you can refuse that fee under HIPAA. If you request the copies to be mailed, however, there may also be a charge for postage, and it should be pretty close to the postage that you see on the envelope that is mailed to you. If you request the copies to be placed on a flash drive or a DVD or some other media like that, there may be a charge for the cost of that media. And again, remember your providers may not wish to use your media because of virus concerns. So <clears throat> when you get the media from the healthcare provider, it should be free of viruses because that's why they will not accept your media. So if you go in and say, please give me copies of my records, here's my flash drive, add it to my flash drive, they will refuse that. But the same is gonna be true when you walk into your provider with your flash drive of records, that provider is unlikely going to wish to plug in your flash drive into their computer because of the fear of viruses. The next right that we're gonna talk about um, oh, we're still on copies, I'm sorry. Um, so when requesting the copies, just remember there may be a delay. So don't expect to walk in and receive your copies on the spot. If the delay will be greater than 30 days, the healthcare organization is required to alert you in advance. If you request the typed reports or a certain report only, your delay will be much shorter. Typed reports are often called abstracts at healthcare facilities, and they include those documents I mentioned earlier. They're typically typed or electronically created. Avoid asking for all records or the entire record. First, the cost will be tremendous to you, and it takes a lot longer for the departments to compile those. There is more guidance at these two URLs. The first one is the HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.hhs.gov forward slash HIPAA forward slash for individuals. And then the second one you'll see is almost identical, but it's for professionals and it has privacy guidance access. So it will give you more information about how you can access your record. And that leads us to the second set of rights. The first one is the right of access. The second one is the request of corrections. You have the right to access, which literally means look at and inspect your records. You may need to schedule the visit to access your records. The Health Information Management Department will often need to assign someone to help you navigate their electronic health record. So when you're accessing your records at an organization that has your records on an EHR, an electronic health record, you're probably gonna be seeing that record on the electronic health record. They won't be printing it out in paper, okay? You also have the right to request a correction, which is known as an amendment. An amendment will only be accepted if the information in your record is incorrect, such as they captured the wrong date of birth, uh, the wrong middle initial, the wrong medic medication. Factual information cannot be amended. So if you don't like the fact that they that the record gives your actual true weight, it cannot be amended. You may need to follow a prescribed procedure to request an amendment. And so the organization will typically publish the amendment policy and procedure on their website. If you don't find it there, contact the organization and ask for their privacy office. The individual in that office will be able to guide you through the process of making an amendment to your record. 
Additionally, it's the erroneous information that's in your record does not get removed from the record. The amendment is additional information added to the record to clarify the incorrect or incomplete information. If you have authorized the organization to send your record previously to someone, maybe another physician or a uh, relative, and that's when you discovered that there was an error in your record, you can ask them to send your corrected, amended record to that individual again, and that is done typically at no additional charge. You also have a right to an accounting of disclosures. You have the right to know if your information was disclosed, that is, sent to someone outside of the organization or physician's office. If your information was used for your treatment or to obtain payment from your insurance company or for the provider's or the facility's operational use, such as for quality assurance activities, these accesses and disclosures will not appear on the accounting of disclosures. Sometimes individuals you have asked the facility to send records to also will not appear on the accounting of disclosures. So if you authorize the facility or physician practice to send records to a specialist in another state, that disclosure may not appear on your accounting of disclosures. Generally, the accounting of disclosures is a list of disclosures to someone you did not know about. So if your information was sent to an entity for purposes other than treatment, payment, and operations, it should appear on the accounting of disclosures. Now, the accounting of disclosures under HIPAA is only required to capture disclosures for the past six years. Examples of disclosures outside of the organization include those where you've authorized individuals to receive your records. Maybe it might be your attorney, social security, disability determinations, a specialist. But entities you might not be aware of to whom your records were disclosed could include state or other registries. The state often has a number of registries that healthcare providers are required, mandated to participate in. Those might include cancer, trauma, there's also congenital anomalies and a number of other uh, conditions that are tracked by the state. There may be authorized research studies where researchers are looking at the treatments that were provided and the causes that may have uh, created a condition that's being assessed for research purposes. Those researchers go through a process in the organization to be authorized to collect data from records. The state health department may periodically do inspections or request information from healthcare organizations. Um, workers' comp may also collect information on an individual who was injured at their work site. So these are examples of disclosures that might occur outside of the organization. The ones that would appear on an accounting of disclosures would include the registries, the researchers, the state health department, and potentially workers' compensation. Now, if you were the worker that was injured, it's likely you authorized workers' comp to contact the hospital for copies of your records. And if that is the case, then 
that release or that disclosure may not appear on your accounting of disclosures. Another right is the right to opt out or opt in, and it could differ from one organization to the next. Each, each healthcare organization, including your physician and provider practices, uh, and when I say provider, I'm including physicians, but I'm also including other providers that might treat you, such as um, a physical therapist or a counselor. And each health insurer is required to publish a notice of privacy practices. You can request a copy or obtain it from the organization's website. In the notice, it may identify that there are disclosures made of your information to other parties. And one of those parties may be for marketing purposes. In this case, you can choose to opt out. You do need to follow the procedure for opting out that is typically described in that notice of privacy practices. And often that means that you need to send something in writing to the privacy office asking that you be removed from uh, the marketing purpose uh, of that organization. A variation of the opt-out right is the right to restrict access. This right pertains to your desire to not share your health information with your health insurance company. It's very specific in this case. If you wish to restrict your access or, or their access to certain care that you've received, you'll need to pay for that care. So perhaps you may have a condition that is a sensitive condition that you do not wish to have your insurance company know about. And in that case, when you receive treatment for that care, you would restrict your health information from being shared with the insurance company. When that restriction is exercised, it, it has to be exercised prior to receiving the care, and you will typically need to pay for the care, and that payment is typically required at the time of treatment. The organization may apply discounts or they may not apply discounts to the fees that they typically charge for that care. Recognize that you cannot restrict access to your protected health information by the health team providing the care. Otherwise, the health team can't provide the care. They won't have the information they need in order to provide you the care. Our next topic is designating a personal health or personal representative. So what is a personal representative? Well, HIPAA allows a patient to appoint a personal representative, and that's a technical term in the regulations, and requires covered entities, which means hospitals, physicians, other healthcare providers, and your health insurance company, to treat the individual's personal representative as the individual with respect to some of those rights that I just discussed. So the uses and disclosures of your individual protected in information. So they will have the same rights to inspect, obtain copies, et cetera, that you have. So what is a personal representative specifically? Well, state law may actually supersede HIPAA in some instances. Generally, if a person can make healthcare decisions for you using a healthcare power of attorney, the person is your personal representative. For children, the personal representative of a minor child is usually the child's parent or legal guardian. Now, in cases of uh, 
separated or divorced parents. It's whomever has the custody for the child. And sometimes there's joint custody. And so that custody uh, statement typically includes a uh, comment about healthcare decisions. For a deceased person, when an individual dies, the personal representative may also die, for lack of a better term. And then the responsibility or the authority falls to the executor or administrator of the deceased individual's estate. Now, your personal representative and your executor of your estate may be the same person. So that personal representative may not actually end at that point in time. One thing about deceased individuals is that your rights to privacy under HIPAA expire after 50 years. So after 50 years, anyone may request copies of your records. A provider or plan may choose not to treat a person as your personal representative if the provider or plan reasonably believes that the person might endanger you in situations of domestic violence, abuse, or neglect. So if there is a belief by a provider or a healthcare entity that you may have been forced to designate someone as your personal representative or it's, it, it appears to be against your will, they can choose not to recognize that individual as your personal representative. Managing your health may involve tracking your expenses that you've incurred during your healthcare journey. This leads us to the provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, TCGA. So first, a disclaimer, you should seek advice from a qualified tax advisor when considering what expenses may be deductible. Health insurance expenses may be deductible up to a limit. If your medical expenses exceed over 10% of your adjusted gross income, you can follow the next few rules to help you get the most from your 2019 tax return. It's gonna vary from year to year, and so again, you want to consult your tax advisor. The medical expenses that you can deduct under TCGA as of 2019 um, is, includes um, dental and vision, as well as medical expenses. It may include medical devices, uh, psychiatric treatments, psychological treatments, preventative care, surgeries, um, and then even mileage or transportation expenses to and from the doctors. For additional information about what you may or may not be able to deduct, you can go to the URL that is provided at the end of the page. There may be other reasons, though, that you may wish to track medical expenses. For example, if you wish to demonstrate that the patient is a dependent of yours, capturing the total medical expenses incurred will be important to be able to substantiate dependency. Additionally, capturing the expenses that you incur throughout your journey of treatment is a way for you to validate the explanation of benefits that you receive from your insurers um, after the treatment is received. So when you're tracking those expenses, spreadsheets are often an easy option. You just add to the spreadsheet that you're using to capture other information, a column for the year and track by the encounter. Don't forget, you may want to track those drug costs. So I've given you an example here where we visited with Dr. Jones, an ENT physician. Our copay was $75. He conducted a test. 
we know that test results are going to be available in two days and then we received the bill for that test and we had a copay of $35. Well, that's bringing us to the end of the session here throughout this webinar. Vita's goal was to emphasize the importance of knowing the value of your health information. Your health information is key in making decisions about your health by you and those around you that serve as your care providers. I'm sure you may have questions. You may forward any questions related to this subject to info at vita.org. I thank you today for participating in this webinar, and I hope that it's some valuable guidance for you. On this last slide, we've identified who helped create this webinar for VITA. And this is additional information about uh, me, your speaker. Thank you again on behalf of VITA.